Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesday. And every Wednesday, uh, we study the book of Proverbs. And today, I'm going to begin with chapter 13. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, they are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So you I hope you'll go back and watch those. But today I'm going to start with chapter 13, verse 1. And let me first just say, praise Jesus. All the glory to our great Savior God, Jesus. Um, so many of my friends and family and, you know, have been going through so many difficulties recently. And uh, I've spent so much time praying for all those people I love. But I also know that our blessings are just amazing. Uh, Jesus created this universe, and creation is beautiful. Uh, so let's keep it all in perspective. Understand that, uh, in spite of the difficulties in life, you know we should just know that uh, Jesus is great. He's our great Savior, God. And not only has he created a wonderful universe and earth, but uh, his promises for our future, for those of us who put our faith in him, are just boggle the mind what he has waiting for us. It's, it's so wonderful. Uh, while I'm on that subject, you can watch my playlist, Heaven. And there's uh, 50 hours. 50 hours studying heaven. That's what we have to look forward to. All right, let's begin now with um, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1. It says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Well, it takes me back to the very first verse, the first chapter of Proverbs, and this has been said uh, over and over again that King Solomon is talking about um, he's writing this to instruct his son so that he will gain wisdom. And through wisdom, we gain so many other things. The first thing that we can gain from wisdom is what Paul said to Timothy is wisdom unto salvation. And wisdom unto salvation is understanding that we need Jesus to be our Savior. We need to no longer believe that we can work our way to heaven. And somehow, if we if we just strive and work hard enough and we'll please God and he'll accept us, we, we need to reject that idea, no longer believing in our own ability and our own performance as an offering to God. Instead, say, I'm a failure. I'm a sinner, and I need this Savior, this only Savior, Jesus Christ. And instead, we put our faith on him. We depend on him completely, rely on him completely. And when we put our faith in Jesus completely, that's when we satisfy God. The Bible says, well, faith is impossible to please God. So put your faith in Jesus for your salvation, and you have wisdom under salvation. So um, that's what the book of Proverbs is all about, uh, teaching us how to be wise, make good decisions in our lives. And Solomon was, wrote this for his son, and, and that's also of equal benefit to all of us who read it today. Um, so it says, a wise son heareth his father's instruction. So the, one of the first things our sons should do is hopefully they're wise enough to listen. I remember my son many, many years ago, um, he thought that uh, uh, experience is the best teacher. You know, I was trying to tell him, give him some advice early in, early in his life, and, and uh, he said, but dad, isn't experience the best teacher? And I said, well, experience is a hard teacher. 
if you that's learning the hard way having to go through through trial and error and the errors can be really difficult and sometimes we don't even survive the errors so it's really foolish to learn through our own experiences if we can learn from the experiences of others well, the scriptures tell us a, a wise man ha has many counselors so being uh, being humble and acknowledging that we don't know it all that we can learn from other people and we can it is wise to listen and hear instruction sometimes the instruction we get is not good instruction but at least we should be willing to listen so sons listen to your fathers hear them out and it says but a, a scorner here not rebuke uh, i recently made a playlist called titled rebukes i think i have about a half dozen videos on there i've made that are rebuking certain types of people and types of types of conduct bad conduct and so i i well, i made these these videos for everybody to understand that this kind of attitude I'm, i i believe the scriptures tell us that's wrong and if if you're guilty of it then i give you that video and rebuke you hopefully you'll hear the rebuke and, and be corrected and change this is a scorner here of not rebuke uh, let me i i want uh, brother joe byron coined as a king james firstist which um, for many years i was a king james onlyist i i still always look at the king james first but i, I do think it's wise to look at other translations and sometimes I can gain even better understanding it can't hurt me it can't hurt me to look at the others so let's go to the amplified because what the amplified does is just expounds a little bit amplifies it or uh, it's like reading the scripture with commentary built into it so let's see if the amplified says anything uh, in addition to this 13 a wise son heeds and is the fruit of his father's instruction and correction. But a scoffer listens not to rebuke. Okay, I think that verse is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. So let's be wise and listen to instruction. Let's not be stubborn and just uh, not listen. And especially when someone's rebuking or correcting us. Uh, uh, you know, I. If you're listening now and you think I'm wrong in anything I say today, or if you've gone through my videos and think I'm wrong, please, please correct me. I, if I'm wrong, I don't want to remain wrong. There's a quote that I, I love that says that remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Who but a stubborn fool? Would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed. So my attitude is, uh, uh, I know that I have been wrong in the past on some theological subjects, and uh, I've been corrected. I've listened, and, and I've changed my mind on a few, on a few subjects. And since I realize that I've been wrong in the past, I have to accept. It's possible I still am wrong on some other things. So if you think I'm wrong, correct me. But, uh, and I will listen to your correction and I will give it a fair hearing. And uh, if I'm wrong and you can correct me, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you correct me and then I conclude that uh, you're, you're not right, then the, the, the worst thing that happened is uh, at least I gained some new insights. I gained your perspective, even though even though I didn't, I wasn't won over to your side. Uh, at least I understand your side now. So be wise and, and listen to correction. Um, verse two says, "A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth." But the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. Well, okay, here's a good example of uh, 
this uh, old English we see in the King James confusing me. And, uh, uh, you know, I could, I'm going to try to figure this out here, and then I'm going to look at the Amplified. But uh, uh, I, I'm a highly educated person. You know, uh, I you know, graduated from college, and I've, I've done extensive uh, um, independent studies on a lot of subjects over many, many years. I'm, I'm educated. And, and yet, sometimes these verses in the KJV confound me. So uh, I don't think you should feel bad if you, don't, if you don't get it the first time you read the KJV. I and mean, maybe you could look at other translations or look at the Greek or commentaries or hear other people's explanation of it. But let's go through this slowly. It says that men shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth. The fruit of our mouth is the words we speak, and so uh, when we when we speak good things, and I guess we're going to get good things back. Uh, like if we are an encourager, if we're honest and not a, a liar and a deceiver, uh, instead of criticizing and picking people apart and just trying to find fault in people, if we if we try to encourage them and uplift them and, and praise them when possible. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, good things that can come out of our mouth. But the soul of the transgressors shall eat violence. All right, transgressors. You know, transgressor could be anybody who's done something wrong. Particularly if, you eat, if, you, if you're doing something wrong to another person, then it's going to come back and bite you. And so you will eat violence. In other words, you will receive violence against you. Uh, you know, as, as a Christian, one who relies completely on Christ for my salvation, I really on, rely on Christ's Holy Spirit to guide me and transform me. Uh, I don't want to respond to people with violence, but I know that there's many people in the world that that's the way they're going to respond. If they feel that you have wronged them, the payback is violence coming against you. So, I believe this is so what that means. Let me see if I can get better understanding from the Amplified verse 2. A good man eats good from the fruit of his mouth, but the desire of the tre treacherous is for violence. The desire of the treacherous is for violence. So some people, they, they desire to be violent. That's just, uh, I mean, it, it, if I get violence, even if I get angry without physical violence, but just anger, I usually feel very bad about it. I feel it's a, it's a failure. And, uh, but I know that uh, there's, there's a lot of people, though, that they love violence. And that's just, they don't really see anything wrong with it. That's just who they are, and uh, that's how they react to things. So let's look at uh, verse 3 now in the KJV. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. <laughs> but he that openeth the wide his lips shall have destruction. <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of recurring themes in the book of Proverbs. And this is one thing that we'll hear many times as we go through this, that uh, it's, it's, it's better just to be silent. Uh, it, it, if, you, if you speak, people will learn how ignorant you really are, how foolish you really are. Sometimes it's better just to keep silent. And uh, if this verse is talking about sometimes if you open your mouth, and you, you'll offend someone. And then the result is you offend someone by being saying foolish things, or rude things, or critical things. And then uh, you'll have destruction. Or as the previous verse said, violence coming against you. There's a verse in the Proverbs says that uh, if you keep your mouth shut, People may think you're wise. If you open your mouth, they'll understand how foolish you are. 
Um, verse 3 in the Amplified says, He who guards his mouth keeps his life, but he who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. You've heard this thing, you know, he's running off his mouth. Um, it, I, I, it's perfectly good to be a talkative person and to be a friendly person, but but some people just talk uh, without thinking, and, and sometimes the things they say are really can be rude or insulting or condescending to other people. And uh, so if rather than saying that, it's just better to say nothing. And my, my, I think uh, my mother taught me that uh, if, you, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. You know? Another thing she taught me was um, don't say anything or write anything that you would not want to be revealed publicly. Uh, if, if I am, uh, if I said something in private to somebody, I should not be worried that what happens if they repeat what I said? Would I be embarrassed or ashamed or found out to, to the, expose the world that I'm a gossiper or mean-spirited or jealous? No, um, if I say something to somebody, I want it to be certain that if it's repeated, I'm not going to be ashamed of myself. And particularly if you write something like that. If you write something to somebody, be sure that, that hey, what happens if that gets made public? Are you going to be embarrassed or ashamed? But uh, in, in James it said, be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to anger. Uh, and this is going right along with this theme in, in we're having here in Proverbs about people who want to talk too much. It's better to be a good listener. Someone said, hey, we've got one mouth and two ears. We should be listening twice as much. You learn a lot more by listening than talking. You know, I want to learn. Uh, I want to teach you, if, but but also I, I don't. I'm not a know-it-all and think that you know I have nothing else to learn and I'm just going to teach everybody. And no, I have a lot to learn. So I think it's a healthy attitude to to want to listen to other people, listen to other viewpoints, particularly on uh, all the minor doctrines. Uh, the uh, on my statement of faith, um, I, I've added this statement that. Uh, in essentials, unity. Let's let's unify around the essentials of Christianity. Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. Uh, Jesus is our only Savior. Faith in Him for our salvation is the only requirement. No religious work is required. Simply faith in Jesus for salvation, and eternal security is is salvation. In other words, if once we put our faith in Jesus, he will never leave us or forsake us. He will never cast us out, no matter what happens afterwards. Once we're born again, we can never be unborn again. So the deity of Christ, faith alone, and Christ alone for salvation and eternal security, these are core doctrines of Christianity. Now, there's a hundred other theological subjects that are fascinating and, and important in varying degrees. Some are more important than others. But everything apart from those Three, I would say, uh, are uh, non-essentials. So in, in essentials, now let's have unity. In non-essentials, let's have liberty. Liberty. You, you're free to come to all kinds of other conclusions on all the minor theological subjects. Uh, if, if you disagree with me, um, I'm not going to say I can't be your friend or... or if you disagree with me, I'm not going to say, well, you're a heretic. No, if you disagree with me, I'm actually going to get quite interested and say, well, why do you disagree? Maybe I'm wrong. Tell me how, what you think and uh, let me consider it. I'll tell you what I think. So uh, in non-essentials, let's have liberty. Let's have freedom to 
disagree and dis discuss these things with courtesy and respect. Uh, but in all things, let's have grace and love. Let's still love each other, show each other grace. Look at the amazing grace Jesus gives us. Can we be gracious to each other, even if we disagree? So, um, that's, I think, the healthy attitude, and uh, let's be good listeners, uh, rather than thinking that we have to spend all of our time doing the talking. Uh, now, KJV verse 4, the soul of a sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Sluggard means a lazy person. So if you're lazy, you're going to end up desiring a lot of things and have nothing. Because you're not willing to go out and get it and work hard for it and do what needs to be done to, to get what you need because of being a sluggard, because of laziness. Uh, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Uh, the diligent is, is the person who's persistent, determined, hardworking. Uh, and, and that person will not lack. Uh, he, he'll be made fat, it says, because fat means he, he's, his, his life will be uh, abundant. He'll have abundance of food and shelter and clothing, all the things he needs, he'll have an abundance. Let's see what verse 4 says in the Amplified. The appetite of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. But the appetite of the diligent is abundantly supplied. If you have a desire for something, go out and work for it. You can do it. Uh, with, with determination and persistence, um, you can pretty much accomplish anything. Uh, people who had meager beginnings in life, very difficult um, uh, family that they're born into, difficult uh, place, uh, culture, and because of determination, persistence, hard work, they, they've risen to the highest heights of achievement. So diligence rather than being a sluggard. Look at verse 5 uh, in the KJV. A righteous man hateth lying. But a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Righteous man hateth lying. Well, let me see. I got saved in December of 1986. So it's about 29 years now, almost 29 years. And I remember it was probably only about maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago. I'd been saved for roughly 20 years. And I remember that I had uh, an appointment with a doctor and I'm getting in the car to go drive to the doctor's office. And I thought of something I would tell the doctor that was not true. I don't even remember what it was or why I even thought I should tell a lie. And I'm thinking about how I want to tell the doctor. And I was shocked. I realized then, whoa, why, why would I even lie to the doctor? Oh, uh, and why would I have this instinct to lie? It, it was an instinct. And it just was, it seemed natural to, to do it without thinking. And I felt really ashamed and uh, realized that even saved for about 20 years, lying was still still in my nature. And I don't know if I've lied since then or not, because that shocked me so much. It made me feel like this. It says, it says a, right, a righteous man hateth lying. Even what we call white lies. Uh, if someone, you're on the phone with someone, they say, hey, can you 
uh, let, let's go to the, the movies to, together tonight. And you say, uh, you say, no, I, I have a, a already uh, other plans. I have to do this or do that. And you really don't have any other plans at all. But you just tell a white lie. Rather than just saying, no, I really don't feel like going to that movie. And I don't, I'd rather just stay home and just, just relax. And, you know, I, I'm not up to going out. Whatever. I and mean, it's just amazing how we make up little white lies all the time. Uh, I hope I don't do it anymore. I can't recall any recently. But I have grown to hate lying. If I do lie, I, I feel a really immediate, immediate shame and guilt over it. Um, I think that's that's a, that's a good thing. I think I think shame and guilt is a good thing when we do things bad. I know some people think that uh, we shouldn't feel bad about even when we sin. I guess. Uh, uh, so I, I believe the Holy Spirit in us is attempting to transform us from a baby Christian into a mature Christian, and uh, the the Spirit is prompting us, trying to guide us, get us to do the right things, have the right thoughts. Uh, and we have a choice. We can listen to the Spirit and embrace it, or we can resist it, resist the Spirit. And uh, that's why you see a lot of Christians that their spiritual growth and maturity uh, is not equal. You can take someone that's been saved for 20 years and one person in the first year you saw them mature an enormous amount. And, and other people over 20 years maybe they mature. Slowly. And do they listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings? To embrace it and, and embrace this transforming effort of the Holy Spirit? Or do they resist it? The Spirit says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think that's when the Holy Spirit is prompting us and we resist it. The Spirit of God is grieved. He even says that we can quench the Spirit. I believe if we if we resist the Spirit long enough over and over again, we kind of end up just tuning it out. Have you ever tuned out someone? They're talking and talking and you just don't want to listen and you just kind of tune them out think about something else and they're going on and on, but you're, you don't hear a word. It's tuning them out. That's, I think, quenching the spirit. The spirit's trying to talk to you and you've completely tuned it out. Um, so it's how we react to the spirit, uh, the efforts of the spirit. See, we... And it's all, it's all based upon uh, the work of Jesus to save us, the work of the Spirit to transform us. It's nothing is based on our works. Our works don't contribute to salvation. Our works don't contribute to spiritual growth. It's all we need to do is just give in and let the Spirit, hear the Spirit, and let it transform us. Uh, so verse... Verse 5 in the Amplified, let's see that. A consistently righteous man hates lying and deceit, but a wicked man is loathsome. His very breath spreads pollution, and he comes surely to shame. Yeah, well, uh, many times the uh, there's this contrast in these verses in Proverbs. Uh, the, the wise man gets this good result. The foolish man gets this bad result. The righteous man gets this good result. The wicked man gets this bad result. And this is, this is example after example after example of what Paul and Jesus mentioned was the um, reaping and sowing. Uh, it's, there's a law, reaping and sowing. And this reaping and sowing law even doesn't even apply only to Christians and to the whole world. We, we will reap what we sow. If you're doing bad things in life, you're going to get bad results out of it. If 
you're doing good things, you're going to gain, you're going to sow. If you're sowing good things, you're going to reap good rewards and achievements. So now let's go to KJV verse 6. Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way, but wickedness overthroweth the sinner. But wickedness overthroweth the sinner. I'll go to verse 7. That's pretty obvious. Verse 6 is pretty obvious. Uh, there is that maketh him rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh him poor, yet great riches. Uh, I believe this is right in line with what Jesus said about uh, uh, you can build up your treasures here on earth, material things, uh, but you can't take it with you into eternity. It's not going to last forever. Moths will eat it, rust will destroy it, you know, your fancy cars, your, your fancy houses, your jewelry, all these things. If that's those are your treasures, then it's, that's, I would say, as Solomon said in, uh, in uh, Ecclesiastes, it's all vanity. Uh, but if, if you're building up your treasures in heaven, these are eternal treasures that last forever. And this is a, another example of that kind of thinking. He that maketh himself rich materially, yet hath nothing. He doesn't have anything of real value because it's just temporal. And then, uh, but, uh, but there, is, there is that maketh him poor, yet hath great riches. In other words, there's some people that they're not dedicating their lives to gaining material wealth. Uh, they're dedicating their lives to, to gaining spiritual wealth, so heaven treasures for heaven, and that's that's true wealth. Let's see if the Amplified agrees with that. Verse seven: and One man considers himself rich, yet has nothing to keep permanently. Another man considers himself poor, yet has great and indestructible riches. So I think Amplified is agreeing with the interpretation I just gave. Uh, let's go to verse 8 in KJV. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. The ransom, a payment to set someone free, or his riches. Well, we know that Jesus said he came to give his life as a ransom, but that's a, a, a ransom. He paid the price to set us free from a guilty judgment and the lake of fire. We're free from that because Jesus paid the ransom with his own blood. Um, but this, I'm not sure, in verse 8, the ransom of man's life are his riches, um, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Well, it's not that the poor doesn't hear rebuke, it's listen, it's just that no one's going to rebuke, rebuke them. Uh, well, let's see if the Amplified agrees with that. Okay, verse 8, a rich man can buy his way out of threat threaten death by paying a ransom. But the poor man does not even have to listen to threats from the envious. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. You know, that's another insight I didn't consider. Uh, and it is, it is a double-edged sword, you know. Um, sometimes people want something and find out when they get it it's not what they thought it would be. Riches. If you gain great rich riches, you have to worry that you'll be kidnapped for ransom or your children will be kidnapped for ransom. You want fame. Well, when you faint and you get fame, then all of a sudden you can't stand all the attention because there's no privacy. Paparazzi are following you around and 
we can't even go out in, in public and just just do normal things without being swamped with people. And so be careful what you wish for and what you work for. But the poor person, he doesn't have to worry about being taken for ransom, kidnapped, or doesn't have to worry about his children being taken for ransom. He doesn't have a ransom that he can pay. So why would someone do that to him? Let's go to verse 9, I think, 9 in the KGV. The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Now look at that in verse in amplified. The light of the uncompromising, com, uncompromisingly righteous is within him. It grows brighter and rejoices. Okay, so now I, they're interpreting it that this light of the righteous. Now, the only one that's truly righteous is one who has the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed on them, imputed to them. It's like we, we put on this white garment, this white robe. It's a picture of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's covering us. So when God looks at us, he sees a righteous person because we have Jesus' righteousness, not our own. Our own righteousness, the scripture says, is no matter how good we think we are, no matter, you can take the person who, apart from Jesus, the only one who's truly righteous, apart from him, you can take any person and the Bible says the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So the righteousness that we gain through our own efforts is, uh, if this is perfection and the best person that ever lived got to be this good, they fall so short. The scripture says we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is perfection. Jesus is this perfect God set this example for us, this standard. We all fall short. So uh, I think this translation is telling us that this righteousness is is uh, the, how is it put again, uh, is within him. And, and it grows brighter and rejoices. See, the, the righteousness we have is Jesus is righteous and the Holy Spirit that is living in us, uh, but not our own. Uh, but it says the, um, but the lamp of the wicked furnishes only a derived temporary light and shall be put out shortly. Well, the light of the wicked, first of all, every person is wicked. Apart from Jesus, every person that ever lived is wicked. That may seem like a shocking thing to, to say, uh, but Scripture says that no one is good. Jesus said, oh, no one is good, only God is good. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's the... Uh, only person that's ever been truly good. No, no wickedness or evil in Jesus. But everyone else, we are wicked. Now, many people attempt to restrain that wickedness that's within us. And, and some people, if you, if you want to judge your goodness by comparing yourselves to other people, you could probably think of some really bad people. Someone, people always bring up Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer. These are examples of really wicked people. We could make a long, long list of, list of infamous people. They're famous for e their evil. Um, and compare yourself to them, and you look pretty good. But Judge, God is not judging us based upon how we compare to other people. We're judged upon how we compare to Jesus Christ. And, and compared to Jesus Christ and his perfection, 
the glory of God. We all fall so short, short that we're all wicked. It's just some are even more wicked than others. That's the first thing that is needed to really understand about us so that we can realize that no matter, even if we make our very best efforts for a whole lifetime, we fall short and we can never um, be good. Good, if you take this one O out of it, is God. And God is, God is the only one who's good. He's, to be good, you have to be God. And you're not God. And I'm not God. So I have to understand that we're, we're not good. We are wicked innately. We have this sin nature. And, and uh, everybody sins. Scripture says if we say we have no sin, we just deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Um, most people I meet, though, the, the, almost everybody admits that we've all sinned. And even if they don't want to call it sin, it's just say, well, I've done some bad things right, that I regret, that I'm ashamed of. Or um, I, I've, done, I've made some mistakes. Whatever, however you want to call it, everybody admits that they're not perfect. They have not lived a perfect life from the moment they... Well, they made their first cry out of the womb until their life is over. They know that they've not been perfect. And that's what you have to do if you want to work your way to heaven. That's what the standard you have to meet. And if you understand that it's impossible, as Jesus said, with man it is impossible. They asked him, how can anybody be saved? And he said, with man it's impossible. So accept that fact. It's impossible. Once you understand it's impossible, then you say, well, whoa, whoa, what, what's my hope? I have no hope. You're right. Only Jesus. He's the only one that can save you. That's why he came, because we, he knew that we had no hope without him. So we put our faith in him, and he does the saving. We put our, uh, and that we, so Jesus does the, the work for our salvation, not us. The Holy Spirit does the work in the transforming and mature spiritual growth and maturity, not us. Let's look at verse 10. By pride and insolence comes only contention. Hmm. Wow. I'm thinking of a lot of people right now, some famous people that I think are full of pride and insolence. Uh, and with that only comes contention. But with the well-advised is skillful and godly wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, that was the Amplified. Now let's look at the KJV, I forgot to look at that first. Only by pride come with contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Well advised, well, that's someone who's listened to advice. You listen to advice, you gain wisdom. The best source of advice is the scriptures. Uh, it, it's the truth. Uh, I, everything has to be tested by the scriptures. Uh, I don't care if it's a uh, um, philosophy or science or professors with PhDs uh, or the most famous theologians. Whatever they say doesn't mean anything to me unless I can see in the scriptures that the scriptures agree. So that's where we, first of all, must test when we hear advice. Let's go to the scriptures and see if it says it. So that's what the Bereans did. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, went into a town and they, they didn't listen to him. And they went into another town called Berea and they listened to him. And they thought he's right, but they didn't just accept it blindly. They went to the scriptures and searched the scriptures to see if everything he said was actually in the scriptures. And that town is called Berea. And, and now we have a term called, are you Berean? Do you do what the Bereans did? Do you, do you just listen to someone and follow them blindly? Or do you go to the scriptures and test them and check them out to see if it's really correct? 
Okay, so now let's look at uh, verse um, 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that garnereth by labor shall increase. Wealth gotten by vanity. Well, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Let's look at the Amplified and see what it has to say. Wealth not earned, but one in haste or unjustly, or from the production of things for vain or detrimental use, such, such riches will dwindle away. Yeah, let's, let's say that uh, uh, many years ago, I was a professional salesman. For, for many years, <clears throat> and I was a champion salesman. I won all the awards, <clears throat> but um, every day I lied to people. Uh, I, looking back, uh, I would really call my profession, I would say I was a professional liar. <clears throat> and uh, the gains I got from it was uh, really almost the same as robbery. <clears throat> because I would convince someone to buy my product or service um, through deception, dishonesty. It was ill-gotten gains. And those things are uh, vanity. Uh, thank you, Jesus, that uh, after I got saved, immediately my my heart was changed and I, I could no longer be in that profession. Well, the spirit and my conscience would not permit it. Um, but he who gathered little by, by little will increase his riches. In order to be patient. Go ahead, work every day. Be wise, save your money. Build up your wealth slowly. Uh, I used to uh, try all kinds of what people call get rich quick schemes. And some of the schemes worked to varying degrees. Uh, but uh, still, there was a lot of deception and dishonesty in, in those things. Uh, but, but when I decided to um, take a, an approach of a get rich slow plan. I would say that it's, it's wise to establish a get rich slow plan. And that a get rich slow plan is just simply okay, you work hard, you live on a budget, you, you save your money, and you, you set so much aside for savings, and you, uh, you make safe investments and over time, like the tortoise and the hare, you're the tortoise, and over 20 years, you'll gain a, gain a lot of wealth if you do that. Uh, and if you get want to get rich quick, then it's no different than gambling. And uh, you may like hit the lottery, but then there's a lot of people who got rich quick and then they lost it all because they, they're just, it, it, in a way, that's just the way their mind works. They're gamblers. They take more risks. Uh, I would say you shouldn't be taking a lot of risks in terms of investing until at least you have your get rich slow plan. It's well established. And then you have some money that you can do um, invest into riskier things. But in all things, it should be done with, if you cannot have a good conscience, uh, I would think that would be foolish. That would be vanity. If you're, if you're trying to get, make money and you know that you're making it in the way that it's dishonest. Verse 12 is hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire is fulfilled it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When the desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. Mm. I well, that is that's the amplified too. Wow. Let's see what the KJV says. 
hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. I have no idea what that means. Well, at first I thought when it says hope deferred, uh, I think that would be like delayed gratification. But I think delayed gratification is a good thing. Why would it make the heart sick? But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. I don't know. If you if you can explain this, uh, let me know. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, a lot of people want things too soon. They're not patient. Like they go in debt to get something now. And then they end up, uh, you know, paying high interest rates and paying a lot more for it over a long, longer, uh, you know, by paying off their debt rather than than uh, getting it right away. Uh, they it would be wise to delay the gratification and, and get it later, but save correctly without going into debt. Another form of delayed gratification is instead of just uh, immediately going and trying to work and get a job, well, maybe if you get a better education, a really good vocation or higher education, it gives you the ability to get a much better job at a much higher earnings. Then uh, you've delayed the immediate gratification of having an income because as a student, you know, you, don't, you won't have the income, you're putting it off. But by getting the higher education, the amount of earnings in a lifetime will be, uh, you know, maybe double, triple, or 10 times greater because you delayed it by uh, waiting and establishing that foundation with a good education. Uh, so I, I think that's, that was my impression. But it says the hope deferred, you, you, your hopes for your f future, for the things you want in life, deferred, putting it off, delaying it, maketh the heart sick. Maybe you're, maybe it means that you're, you're feeling like sick. Oh, I really want it now, but I'm, but I'm, if you're disciplined enough to put it off, when the desire cometh, when you finally get what you've desired, it is a tree of life. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to stop here uh, after verse 12. I'll do the second half of this chapter next Wednesday. Uh, so let me make a note. It'll be Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13. That's where we'll pick up next time. Now, uh, I, I never want to have one of these broadcasts or videos without uh, an invitation to receive salvation. Uh, I've talked a lot about this throughout the video, so let me sum this up if you're not if it's not clear to you. Uh, the scripture says we're all sinners. Now I know that some people sin more than others, but we're all sinners. If you've sinned one time or ten times or a million times, you're still a sinner, you're unfit, you're not perfect. And, and, and if you're thinking that types of sins make a difference too, you're, you're, you're wrong. It doesn't matter the type of sin. Everybody has their own proclivities. For, for me, um, in my youth, um, uh, I was sexually promiscuous. And as I said earlier, I was dishonest and lied. Those are the types of sins that, uh, that I did uh, primarily. Maybe your sins are different. Maybe you think they're worse sins, or maybe you think they're, oh, they're not as bad. They're little white lies or something. It doesn't matter the type of sin. It doesn't matter the quantity of sins. The fact is we need to understand we're all sinners, and we can't be with God because there's a barrier. God's perfect. We're not. There's a barrier. We cannot be with him. No matter how hard you try to be good, you can join all the religions of the world, you can become the most religious person. Uh, you could, you could uh, pray five times a day on a rug and make a trip to Mecca like a Muslim. 
You can, you can um, get uh, baptized, go to confession, communion, confirmation, and light candles, and all those things as a Roman Catholic. Uh, you, or you can just try to follow the commandments and be just the letter of the law. And, and guess what? The most religious person still fails. You cannot be perfect. So Jesus understood that man was in a hopeless, helpless situation. So he said that he came down from heaven. He says he became a man. God was manifest in the flesh and lived among us. The re he said the reason he became a man was so he could give his life as a ransom. So in other words, God couldn't die for on that cross. So he had to become a man so as a man he could die. Uh, so Jesus gave his life as a ransom. That's a payment made to set us free. So Jesus died on the cross and paid for the sin. So that now he said, as he died, he says, it is finished. It's completed. It's accomplished. He set out what he intended to do. He paid for all our sins. So here's God who's perfect. Here's you with all your sins. 2,000 years ago, your sins were all put on Jesus. And now the sin barrier that kept us apart from God is removed. Now we're free to connect and embrace God and have this relationship with God. We're free to do that. But we can only do it with faith in Jesus. Uh, the scripture says, what must I do to be saved? What you must do if you want to be with God, you want to live in heaven forever, you want to have eternal life, is, it says, you um, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on Jesus. Believe he paid for your sins. And then you will be able to be with God. And the, the scripture says that uh, we are, are, are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. The moment we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, and, and our dead spirit that's in us is united and connected and your spirit is regenerated, quickened, brought to life, and now you're alive spiritually. That's why Jesus said we must be born again from above, born spiritually. And once you've done that, Jesus said he'll never leave you or forsake you. That means that this connection, that this uh, birth, new birth that you have can never be undone. So you can rest and know and be confident and joyful that you're gonna to go to heaven. No matter what happens in the future, you did the one thing that was required to you. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. So you put your faith in Jesus and you're promised eternal life in heaven. Now, um, there, Jesus gave us a sign so that we can feel confident in believing that this message I just gave you is true. The Jews demanded a sign when Jesus was making all of his claims. He claimed to be God, he claimed to be the Savior, and uh, he claimed to be the only way to the Father. And uh, they said, well, give us a sign to prove your claims. He, he says, the sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall I be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The heart of the earth, that's a tomb. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He promised, he said that he would raise himself from the dead on the third day as a sign. And that's what happened. He was crucified. Your sins were all put on Jesus. And he paid for your sins. He died, he was buried, and on the third day, he raised himself from the dead. And the scriptures tell us that he appeared to the apostles, to the 12. Uh, he, he appeared to James, his brother. He appeared to hundreds of other people at the same time. They touched him, they talked with him, he, they, he, Jesus ate with them. Uh, and then he ascended up to heaven. He was resurrected, living resurrected body for 40 days. So there, 
the proof of this bodily resurrection of Jesus is so well established. It's, it's really one of the most proven historical events in history. That's the sign that can give you confidence to say, I can trust Jesus. I, I believe him. He, and that's what believing in Jesus really means. You believe in his ability to give you life in heaven forever. He's able because he's God. Uh, you believe in his faithfulness to keep that promise. He promises you eternal life in heaven if you'll put your faith in him. And believe he's faithful. Believe he does keep his promises. Scripture says he cannot lie, he cannot break a promise. So knowing all that, when we put our faith in Jesus, we should have, as it says in Proverbs, uh, peace like a river. Don't worry. You're going to heaven. Joy like a fountain should be joyful every day because you've received the free gift of eternal life. Put your faith in Jesus now, and if you do, make a comment on this video and let me know. I'll see you next Wednesday for the remainder of chapter 13 of Proverbs. And join me also at Sundays, also 1 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, I do character studies, and we're studying uh, Joseph, uh, the son of, uh, of uh, Jacob, Israel. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.